Yeah. That's just weird math. 17, 29, and 493. I think it's just not supposed to make sense. Hello, everybody. To our new listeners, welcome. To our old listeners, welcome back. We are the Perspective Potterheads, Jenny B and Terry T. And we're here to discuss our favorite fandoms, starting with and primarily featuring Harry Potter content. So if you like our content, like it. And if you love it, share it, subscribe, support. Um, Today, we're going to be talking about Harry Potter and the Sorcerer's Stone, Chapter 5, Diagon Alley. And just to note this, while we're talking about chapter five today, we will talk about chapter five, the end of the book, um, book six, book seven, book three, maybe book two. It gets mentioned. So spoilers, spoilers, spoilers. If you have not read the books, you might want to read them first. Mm -hmm. Read along with us. Or at the very least, watch the movies. No. Read the book. (laughs) Read the the books. Don't listen to her. (laughs) Yeah, the movies do put out so much, but if you don't have time to read the books, then we'd fill you in on everything you're missing. Get the audiobooks and listen to us. Yeah, get our very, very cool perspective. I think we do have some pretty awesome perspectives, if I do say so myself. So we are now going to Diagon Alley. So exciting. This is where it starts. Like, I know, like last chapter, we're like, okay, it's starting to get magical. This is exciting. We get to see some real magic. Like, and then this chapter, it's like, you get to experience it with Harry, that shock and awe of the magical mm-hmm. world. It's amazing. Have you ever heard the theory that it's all a dream? Yeah, I don't like that theory. I don't either. And I mean, there's only two times where Harry even thinks that it's a dream. It was one in the last chapter. And then in this one, in, it's like italicized. And there's Aunt Petunia knocking on the door. Like, and... I don't know. There's, there's too much stuff. And if it was a dream, I don't think he would concoct as many negative stories for himself. I know (laughs) some of this would not be very dreamlike. Right. Although I've had some really weird dreams like nightmares, but they're never coherent like this. No. And this expands like his entire lifetime. Like, so if he's just this 11 year old boy dreaming this, Mm -hmm. how does it span that? Like you would have to have been asleep for quite a while. Well, there is the, there's somebody, there's the other theory that he's gone insane. And that, like, this is like the device, the coping device that he's made up in his mind. I like that it's real. Like that's, I, I do I, too. Like, I like that for, it's real for, as the, well. for that world. Like, unfortunately I can't say, oh, I wish it was real for real because, well, I do wish it was real for real. That'd be super cool. But <laughs> I like that. it. I, I don't, I don't like the, he's insane or there he's dreaming or, you know, that's not yeah I want this to be real for him yeah let me so yes I want this to be real too and I honestly I was thinking (laughs) about this earlier today because I'm wondering if the reason that things go kind of haywire around muggles has the same kind of effect as mercury retrograde (laughs) like that's why they just don't do electronics because they're all tied in with like the nature of it all and mercury retrograde messes with electronics and communication and it's like okay i understand <laughs> why i would like when we had that time without spectrum for a day a full like 24 hours no internet i would have loved to have had outpost <laughs> right <laughs> something to be able to communicate with people because we had nothing you no internet no phone it right. was it was a rough it was a rough day <laughs> one day One day, one day. day Do you remember when there wasn't internet? I do. Like, I remember not having internet. (laughs) I do. Having dial up. Right. I, that sound, it's still there. You go like turn the computer on, then you go get a snack and come back. And And then maybe at the same time, you search your thing and go get a drink and come back. And it took like a day to print something. (laughs) Pepperidge Farm remembers. I don't know. All right. So, so it does start with he think he thinks it's a dream. He's like, I yeah. must be dreaming. And Hagrid spends the night with. The, I mean, the Dursleys are still there. I mean, that's what just is the Dursleys like hiding in that bedroom with Dudley with his tail? Yeah, but even though they're hiding in the other room with Dudley and his tail, like that's got to be the most awkward thing <laughs> ever to spend the night <laughs> with. 
Hagrid, I, I don't, it. I think Hagrid doesn't really appreciate nuance and I don't think he feels awkward at all. He's like, yeah, he deserved it. I'm done. I suppose. I feel like it would, it would probably be very awkward for the Dursleys, although they did lock themselves in that room all the rest of the night. Yeah. And right. I, I can't imagine like Harry, Harry falls asleep. I don't know that I could fall asleep. Like <laughs> no giant just told me I'm a wizard. Let me go take a nap. Right. <laughs> yeah. I, I mean, mean the and he arrived at midnight. So by the time they were, had that conversation and fell asleep, it's probably good two o'clock in the morning. Mm-hmm. And I don't know what time that owl arrives to, to deliver the paper and wake him up. I don't know. Paper delivery usually is a pretty early thing. It is. So the owl has the news here and it's it, like, it's attacking Haggard's coat. Cause it knows that's where the money is. I was wondering uh-huh. if it knew that that's where the money was or if, because Haggard had door mice in there. Probably. <laughs> Cause otherwise he would be attacking Hagrid, right? Like, Hey, wake up and give me money. Exactly. That'd um, be a pretty smart owl though, to be like, I'm going to find the five canucks myself. Mm-hmm. It's interesting. Sometimes the owls carry things in their beak and sometimes they carry them like it's tied to their leg. Yeah. This one, the owl had it in its beak. I, I think that's an interesting, like it just back and forth all throughout the book. Like I was listening to book five and the after the mentor attack and lots of owls are coming and some of them are carrying like the letters from the ministry are carried in the owl's beak, but the note from Mr. Weasley and from Sirius are tied to the owl's leg. So I don't know, because they're shorter notes on parchment, whereas the owls have the bigger notes in the envelope and they carry them in his beak. Be uncomfortable. Or maybe it's like just the preference of the owl or the person. I don't know. Just a thought. I don't know. I don't know too much about owl anatomy to know like the different beak shapes maybe. And maybe some, they depending on the type of owl it is, can carry it in their mouth better than others or I I also don't know how long owl's legs are underneath all those feathers yeah I just kind of adventure that like if it's a short like on a roll of parchment they could roll it up but if it's in an envelope they've got to hold it in their beak because that was my like just a note so Harry has this happy balloon inside him and then he feels like it had a puncture because he doesn't have any money And Uncle Vernon said, I am not paying for him to study magic. He needs all sorts of nonsense and I'm not buying it. Mm -hmm. Hagrid's like, oh, don't worry about it. You got money. Yeah. It's the one and only bank. Yeah, they only have one. Yeah. And he he said, I think he said the wizard bank, Gringotts, run by goblins. So (laughs) is it a wizard bank or a goblin bank? (laughs) Is a goblin bank. Because it becomes very apparent in, in book seven that there's an issue as the wizards try to usurp control of the bank. Mm -hmm. Which is just really weird that there is only one bank because knowing the history between goblins and wizards and some underlying distrust, you know, there Mm -hmm. between them, there's, I would, I would think that there'd be at least another bank besides Gringotts. You know, that does kind of make sense. And how long has Gringotts been a thing? Like, is this all the way going back or is Gringotts more of a newer thing since like after the goblin rebellions and such? Yeah, I have no idea. I I really, really need JK Rowling to write me a history of magic and Hogwarts a history. (laughs) Those are the things I need in my life. So if for some reason someone could show her this little clip, I'm begging. I really, (laughs) really need Hogwarts a history and I really need a history of magic. I'm a history lover. That is what my degree is in. I need the wizarding history now. <laughs> I think a lot of that is Pottermore or Wizarding World because they've they've like renamed it um, since they started doing the Fantastic Beast. But that's pretty much what it is. The only thing is that is clunky. Like, it's, I mean, there's so much stuff on there. It's and and they change it too. I've heard that McGonagall's thing said one thing, but then when they made that error. Like there was a continuity error on her um, with the latest movie. And so then they changed it on Pottermore Hmm. so that it got rid of that continuity error. So I don't know. They, and they used to have like, 
might be dating myself now. Well, I mean, I think we already did <laughs> talking about the internet, but, <laughs> um, but they used to have a website. It's like jkrolling.com or something like that. And it was about like, you had to actually think there were games inside of it. Like you could point and click on certain things. And if you caught the fly, then this would open. There was a phone and you could dial the magic and then it would op- unlock something else. And it was so cool. Ooh, that sounds like fun. I don't know if it's still up and running or not. I haven't tried it in years, but then they switched to Pottermore and then they switched to Wizarding World. So once, you know, the popularity grew and grew and grew. I like that even in this like description of Gringotts, it's the Wizard's Bank run by goblins. You'd be mad to try to rob it. Hmm. Which kind of sets us up for later on. Yeah. And it comes up like that's mentioned twice, like, like I said, Hagrid says it twice. You'd be mad to try to rob it, which mm-hmm. it comes up later in this book. And then it comes up later in the series. Like yeah. Robin Gringotts is kind of a thing. Like, Which it's uh, crazy that like nobody ever does it. And then within Harry's lifetime, Voldemort and Harry. Yeah. So it can't obviously be that difficult. Not that, you know, they're not very skilled, but I mean, Harry is just out of Hogwarts in the seventh book when he robs Gringotts with two other people. Oh, and he does have goblin help. Yeah. With Harry, he has goblin help, but I'm wondering like, how does Quirrell do it? <clears throat> yeah. I mean, Ron says, cause I just read the, the, <laughs> the next chapter um, that they, that it must've been somebody who used dark magic, which that even then, the you know, like if, if they can't explain it, it's dark magic. Like how did right. Sirius get out of Azkaban? It must be dark, dark. magic. <laughs> And that's the thing is like, if you know that there's dark magic that can get through your defenses, then you have to defend to defend against that dark magic as well. So, and I mean, they do discuss it like, with, with maybe grip hook, like the defenses were very low on that bolt because it was empty. Yeah. Um, maybe Quirrell, because nobody would have ever suspect poor stuttering professor Quirrell, like, I don't know something with the turban some sort of Voldemort sneaky spirit thing going around he doesn't have his turban yet Voldemort hasn't no. used it he Voldemort does not possess him until after he still has the turban though right I don't think so I think in the movie he does but in the book he does it does not mention his turban okay I'm gonna look now um so this is one of my big continuity things and I don't know how but on but harry asks how he gets there and he says he flew flew. and i'm like how in the world did hagrid fly because he can't a broomstick won't support his weight right i have that as a note like he doesn't have the motorbike he's too big for brooms or thestrals and it's not flu as in flu powder because the spelling would have been differently Mm -hmm. um and he says he's not supposed to use magic at all. So, and I mean, and they are just floored when Voldemort says he can fly. So, yeah, so how did Hagrid fly? Right. It's just. It's very. <laughs> I was now, I was wondering if an Abraxan would be big enough to support him. Mm. But I'm not. What happened 100%. to it? What did he do with it? <laughs> Yeah. I did. Does he just like say, get up. And then like, it knows that's way back home or box. Oh, I hadn't even considered that. That's a really good thing. Cause he can carry immensely heavy loads. Like he pulls, <laughs> like, I'm sure Ron, Harry, Ginny, Lockhart together, like would be kind of close, maybe kind of close to Hagrid's weight. Maybe. So still, and, and then Fox would just, you know, fly back to Dumbledore mm-hmm. or do his like flesh and flame thing. Right. Oh, we're going to have to, I can't wait till we get to that scene. Like some of these really fancy things that Dumbledore does. Dumbledore does some really cool things. Yeah. I have a whole, oh, I can't wait till talk about that because I have a whole thing on <laughs> where Dumbledore goes in mm-hmm. book five. I don't think he leaves. I think he just hangs out in his office. I I think we talked about this before. I think he uh-huh. goes to the pub. <laughs> okay. We, we'll that get is, 
as I get there. <laughs> Several books. And so that's like uh, two years down the road. We'll talk about it. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, so, so he, so he flies there, but they can't fly away because then he's not supposed to use magic once he's got Harry. So they steal the boat that the Dursleys went in, which leaves them stranded on the island. And then mm-hmm. Hagrid does magic anyway to speed the boat across. Which, okay, Hagrid is not a fully qualified wizard, for one. For two, he's not a very good wizard, period. Like, even when he was learning magic, he was not, he wasn't your star pupil. He was closer Mm -hmm. to Neville than he was to Hermione. Yeah. We're on a spectrum of students. Right. He takes that umbrella, tap, tap, nonverbal spell, broken wand. Yes. I'm like, whoa. So he he's pretty magical consider and he's not even a full wizard like i mean mm-hmm. yeah we know muggleborns and whatever they're not full wizards but they're but they are but they aren't mm-hmm. but he's also a giant which yes. is like he's not fully human wizard so it his power must be there's something there maybe dumbledore gave him private lessons somewhere along the line i'm sure had to have and the whole thing like I don't know. Dumbledore, there's a huge amount of trust in Dumbledore. Mm-hmm. And Dumbledore has a lot of trust in Hagrid, considering all of Hagrid's shortcomings. I'm going to yeah. go pick up this very, very important thing for Dumbledore. And okay, you're this very important thing mm-hmm. that hopefully and- he doesn't get tricked into telling somebody about. Right. So- and so I think Dumbledore, it's, it's like that, the liability versus like the outcome type of thing or whatever, like that risk management type of deal. And so I don't know, there's, there's that thing where Dumbledore just kind of really wants that loyalty and the loyalty is- to him is going to benefit him in the long run versus the little bit of risk that might happen along the way for some of these other things. I don't know. So I like that Hagrid is reading the paper and his comment is the ministry is messing stuff up again. <laughs> yes. I knew you were going to make that comment because that just, I feel like I was having a conversation about our news and I will not go into what the conversation was about. My husband was talking about something in the news and I'm like, all I could think of is ministry of magic messing stuff up again. <laughs> Like, Mm -hmm. that's how I'm like, oh my gosh, why can't we just not do this? It all relates. I can always give it a Harry Potter reference when I talk about it. Always. But yeah, that, that, that line resonated very well with me just in general. Um, And I love how Harry's like, ministry of magic, what do they do? Yeah. And Hagrid's basic answer is like, they keep the muggles from knowing about us, but the ministry is huge and has, it's so multifaceted. Mm-hmm. It does seem like a lot of what they do does revolve around muggles though. And maybe it's because we see more of that because Arthur Weasley's job is yes. pertaining to muggles. Um, but a lot of it does have like modifying their memories as far as this or that. And uh, I, I they, think it, they like, can use- there's so much, there's so many branches within the ministry. Like you've got the uh, regulation of magical creatures. You've got the um, department of mysteries. You've got mm. the aura office, the, um, you know, all of that. But like the, but when the auras fight the dark wizards, the dark wizards are usually taking it out on muggles. Mm-hmm. And um, the, like magical sports and stuff like that, they had to find a muggle area. So they had to modify a bunch of muggle things. They had to obliviate and modify memories of a bunch of muggles. Like everything that they do. I don't do, think they care so much about the muggles. I think they're, that's uh Well, there's, there's more, a there's more to that. Because they're, they're walking through the through the park and everybody's like packed with muggles. Look how, how do these muggles get along like this? <laughs> like muggle, muggle, muggles in the muggle world. I know. Like I well, Hagrid just sticks out. Like if you saw a guy that's like twice as tall as everybody else, you'd be going, hmm, that's yeah. strange. I think they made uh, an illustration about him somewhere that, and I don't remember where it was. I don't even know if it was in this chapter, but I would estimate him about 10 feet tall. That sounds about right. 
I love how in this, they start setting some things up. Mm-hmm. Um, and Rowling is really good at this. I think it's one of her strengths as an author. Um, we're going to talk about characters in, in a few minutes, probably like the characters that she introduces that will come into play later. Even some of them more major, some of them more minor. Yeah. Um, but that we do see again. Um, but you know, this is where they mentioned for the first time, they want a Dumbledore for minister. Mm-hmm. This is where we learn Hagrid wants a dragon. And that plays a, a very vital role in this book. And even later, like the dragons are a pervasive theme mm-hmm. throughout the books. Um, Cornelius so, Fudge is mentioned and he plays a huge role mm-hmm. later. Yes, we have it. Especially, in, Fudge, especially in five. Fudge start. I think we meet Fudge for the first time. In three? Two. In two. Two. Yeah. I was like three, no two. Because ha- yeah. Harry knows who he is, but Fudge doesn't know Harry. Fudge right. doesn't know he's but, been met. <laughs> right. They they meet him officially in three. In three. But they but they they see him and he overhear his conversation. We meet him. Yeah. Uh, Fudge being the... Fudge is very interesting. He's your stereotypical, at least for me, he is like the stereotypical politician. Mm-hmm. He's out for himself and to make that name and all that stuff, asks people for help, but takes the bribe money on the side from Malfoy. Mm-hmm. We ha- everybody has our lobbyists, even in the wizarding world. Um, I think we get a little bit of, of Hagrid's personality. I love how Hagrid's sitting on the train knitting. I love that yeah. Hagrid does all these like housewifey homey skills. Like he knits, he, uh, darns his own socks, mm-hmm. he wears a flowery apron. Like I love the character of Hagrid. And I think I said that last time, but I just love that he's so, he's such an inviting character. Like I want to go sit in Hagrid's hut. Do you think that Dumbledore taught him to knit or that they knit together sometimes? Because Dumbledore likes knitting patterns. <laughs> yeah. Probably. <laughs> I can just see Hagrid and Dumbledore sitting there knitting together. Right? Like what would Great mental what does image. Dumbledore knit? Like I don't and know, does Dumbledore like, knit like Hermione things? knits? Like Hermione can knit in the muggle world by hand but once mm-hmm. she gets back to hogwarts she uses magic knitting is something right. that comes up throughout the books too hmm. i wonder if that's like you know when the artist puts some of their own work into the writing type of thing do you think jk rowling knits i don't know that is an interesting question knitting is very relaxing if you say so. I tried to cross stitch when I was younger because my that's how my mom used to relax. No. I can only knit like a straight scarf. That's what <laughs> I knit. Uh, I picked it up in college as a something that I had to think about but didn't have to think about, if that makes sense. Mm-hmm. I enjoyed knitting. Um, so Hagrid's knitting on the train and he gets, Harry gets out his list. Yes. And This is, you know, we're meeting more people even just in this list. Um, Yeah. Most notably, Batilda Bagshot and Newt Scamander. I mean, Newt Scamander becomes a thing separate (laughs) as- A whole other series. A whole other series, which- I know. Can't wait till April. I know, me too. (laughs) Um, And then Batilda Bagshot, you think of her, like, it's interesting when you see this list, like Matilda Bagshot, just, you wouldn't even think that she's important. Right. She's an author of a book, Mm -hmm. The History of Magic, the most boring of all magical subjects, unless you're me. Yes. I don't care how boring Binz is, I'd be taking my (laughs) notes. Um, Matilda Bagshot does play a very important role. She comes up she's not she doesn't become a an actor we don't realize that she's an actual person until like or a person that's still alive mm-hmm. until i think seven is where they really talk about her right i think i think you're right i don't think that they really mentioned her any other time aside from they, that they mentioned the book i think in book three well oh, they, they mentioned the book but... hermione is quoting a history of magic forever <laughs> So, and Miranda Goshock, I think she's the only one that we 
repeatedly hear of every single time because there's the standard book of spells, spells. grade one through every year that they're there, I believe. I like how he he's there, he's sitting there with Hagrid and he's like, this might, are the jurors like playing a joke on me? And then he's like, no, 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 they can't be playing a joke. They have no sense of humor. <laughs> right. So hold on. These course books, because, okay, we all know the standard book of spells would be for charms and a history magic would be for a history magic class. And a beginner's guide to transfiguration would be for transfiguration, a thousand magical herbs and fungi, herbology, magical drafts and potions for potions, fantastic beak for care of magical creatures, the dark forces for defense against the dark arts, but magical theory, what is that book? What class is that book Well, for? I think like the standard book of spells, it handles charms, but it also has some transfiguration. A thousand magical herbs and fungi, yeah, they use it for, um, herbology but they also use it for potions for potion ingredients so i think there's some crossover and i think magical theory because they talk about the first transfiguration class like they take a lot of complicated notes mm-hmm. and there's a lot of like theory behind um trans- i think it would probably be used for transfiguration mostly maybe some charms okay. but i think that magical theory is really an important so then, like all of all of the teachers would have to be kind of in alignment with their syllabus with their syllabi to to go along with the flow of that book to cover all of their subjects for a year one so i think there's there have to be some collaboration at least between flitwick and mcgonagall potion seems a little separate herbology seems a little separate but like you see them work together in later books like in book six slughorn when Harry finds Slughorn, he's trying to get the memory. Sh- he's getting stuff from Professor Sprout for potions. And he's like, so my, I think it was his third years or making something. Mm-hmm. And he needed something specific and Sprout had it. So when, and so when, you know, I'm going to save this question for when we actually attend transfiguration class. <laughs> Okay. Never, I'm gonna I'm gonna pin that question. Never mind. Um, do you understand wizarding money at all? Not at all. I actually had that. <laughs> that's actually I I had that down when we get to Gringotts, but I'm just like. <laughs> I, oh, I I think I think my note here is actually like, how do you not understand Muggle money? I just saw Muggle money, and I was like instantly, I'm like, wizard money is, confuses me. But how? So if you can understand wizard money, how do you not understand muggle money? I think it's a matter of comfort. And it's interesting, like, because I've used a different currency for a chunk of time. Mm -hmm. Um, But it really was very apples to apples kind of thing. Like the euro and the dollar are pretty similar. The only thing I really loved about European, like the euro, is that there's more coins Mm-hmm. So it was, I, I could have like 20 bucks in my pocket in coins. <laughs> yeah. I went Without to Canada, being, like super weighed down. I, I went to Canada and I was like, I was using loonies and toonies like everywhere because I was excited to use them. Mm-hmm. Like, I'm like, this is new to me, but I know how much they're worth because like one and two are really easy to add. Yeah. But it, not like, I think I did the math somewhere on here one galleon is 17 sickles one sickle is 29 knuts so there's 493 knuts to a galleon (laughs) so yeah that's just weird math 17 29 and 493 i think it's just not supposed to make sense i if they did a good job then (laughs) it's not supposed to make sense and i like it (laughs) <laughs> I mean, I guess if that's what you're used to, that's what you're used to. You use it. Like people who use the metric system, which the metric system makes way more sense. Like even it like does. our inches to 12 uh, inches in a foot. And uh, yeah, our, like, our system is, is our system, up. the standard system, like, it's just not our, our measurements are wonky. Whereas the metric system, it's all by tens. Right. I would, I think we should switch to metric. Me too. Yeah. I have a hard time. I'm like, I don't know how many feet are in a mile. I had to memorize that for some, it's like over 5,000. <laughs> The exact thing doesn't matter to me because I'm not in that field, but 
Yeah. Even then, people in that field do generally switch to the other terms from when they can, because it's easier. Mm -hmm. And it'd be nice if freezing was zero. Yeah. I do <laughs> freezing when it was is 32 camp- degrees because my when kids didn't in- understand that I was like it's zero degrees they're like it's freezing outside I said well yeah it's freezing outside but no it's um below freezing freezing's 32 and they just kind of were like huh when I was in Canada I learned like a trick to do off the top of my head and I can't remember it to like to switch back and forth between Celsius and Fahrenheit and it's not exact but it's like multiply by two and then add something I, I don't know because I'm not I don't need to do it on a regular basis, but, there, but there's, there's, a, there's a neat trick to doing it and you get ballpark temperatures. It's like the difference between like 79 and 82 type mm-hmm. of thing. I accidentally put my, uh, I don't know how I did it. I, I got it fixed, but I had my van set to kilometers. The other day. I was like, <laughs> like, something's wrong with that. Cause I'm like, I am not going that fast. I'm not going that fast. And I was like, Oh, it's kilometers. Whoops. I was really, I was having a day. That's, that's when you just kind of like look around to see how fast everybody else is going. And you're just like, I'm going the speed of traffic. That's all that matters. Half the time on the roads, that's all that matters anyway, unless you're in North Kingsville. <laughs> it was rough. I was like, I'm pushing buttons. It was funny. Mm-hmm. Um, so the leaky cauldron. I like how hey, hey, Harry's distributed. It's a grubby looking pub. Nothing is sh- like, it's not like this shiny, beautiful thing. Like even later when they describe the three broomsticks, warm and inviting, mm-hmm. um, this is a grubby looking pub, something that most people's eyes slid from the record store on one side to the restaurant on the other. I think it was a restaurant. I didn't write it down. It yeah. Just whoosh, right over it. Glanced over it. And Harry's like, I think Hagrid and I are the only ones that can see this. Um, and I, I love the landlord knows exactly what Hagrid wants. The usual Hagrid again, Hagrid with his alcohol problem. Mm-hmm. So speaking of just glancing over things though, Harry doesn't even notice his second piece of paper in the envelope until the next day, which it's one thing to be all excited that, Hey, I got this letter and I'm a wizard, but the letter that he read specifically says, you know, hey, there's another piece of paper that'll tell you all of your, like, what's it say? Books and all the necessary books and equipment. I think he was more like, what do you mean I'm a wizard? And needed a lot more <laughs> clarification. Me, yeah. I'd have been like, I'm a reader and I like paperwork. So I'd be like, yeah, so that's, that would have been me too. I'm like, hold on, let me read what this other piece Listen, of paper Let me read the too. second page. There's a second page here. Maybe there's a disclaimer. Yeah. <laughs> on second thought, maybe no, you're not. I, that's what I would be looking for. Although um, I'm glad, like, story-wise, it's better that it's not all in one chunk, you know? So of course, story's got a story. So. And some people are less paperwork oriented and he's only like, again, he's only 11. Mm -hmm. I don't know how paperwork oriented my almost 11 year old is probably not. Yeah. But, but, but if, if you're, if, if she was going to be going to Hogwarts, cause she's going to be 11. And if she got this letter, she would be reading it like crazy. She'd be like, where do I get my pointed hat? And she'd be wearing that hat all day, every day. <laughs> I want to get it off of her. Which they don't even mention the hats later on in the books. Do they, do they have to wear them when they're older? Or is it just like, so on common occasion nobody ever them. talks about it? On occasion, they mention them, but. Do they? Well, I feel like they mention them more for professors. And not so much for students. Mm-hmm. I don't know that they wear, I think they wear them like on feasts and I, I think, and I could okay. be wrong, but they might mention them in book four when they're okay. getting ready for. It's yeah. more like a special occasion thing. Mm-hmm. The hat. Um, so we're in the, we're in the leaky cauldron and it goes sad. Hagrid's like, I'm just taking young Harry here. You just seem like, haha, look, showing off. Right. And the pub goes silent. And there's so much excitement around Harry. And we meet people. We meet a lot of people. Like, there's a line of people just wanting to shake his hand. Uh, Doris Crockford, Deedalus Diggle. I, like, obviously professor Quirrell Mm -hmm. jot down a page number um 
Tom, obviously the landlord. And Daedalus Diggle's like, he remembers me. <laughs> I want Daedalus Diggle, like, I love him. He makes me smile. He seems like a generally happy, good hearted guy. Yeah. We need his backstory. I know. I want his backstory because he's I'll, mentioned I'll on Pottermore. He's mentioned Wait. in the first chapter. Mm. Never had much sense. <laughs> um, I like that Harry's like, is Professor Quirrell always like that? Like, is that normal? Yeah. Um, he took a year off to get firsthand experience because he can't consistently be Defense Against the Dark Arts teacher. Right. Um, and now he's all nervous and scared. <laughs> so I thought vampires were going to be more of a thing in the Harry Potter series. They're not. I'm kind of glad because it's a little I overdone. Mean, it, yeah. Especially at the time that this came out, mm -hmm. he also had twilight series come out. And so that was, they covered the vampire werewolf thing pretty well. I mean, there are werewolves in here and typically vampires, werewolves go together along with witches and whatever, but uh, yeah. Cause I mean, even in the Silky Stackhouse series, like that starts with vampires and then you add the werewolves and then you get to your witches. Like, mm -hmm they're all connected so I and mean, we do see one vampire in i think book six yes saying we need and they also mention i think in book three the blood flavored lollipops no no those are for vampires yes but they don't like it's not a thing we had a kitten named sanguini one time <laughs> do they like to bite you we had didn't we had rehomed him. We didn't have him for very long, but mom called him Sanguini because all of our cats have had all of the pets through my mom's house are Harry Potter named up until their current dog, which she's Doctor Who. <laughs> nice. Um. So they have. At, at Ilop's Owl Emporium, they have Tawny, Screech, Barn, Brown, and Snowy Owls. And I'm really surprised that Harry is the only person with a snowy owl. I know. Like, Hedwig and, is rare. Yeah. And but, how does Hagrid afford, like, does Hagrid have, like, like he probably doesn't, like, pay for his, like, his hut is on the grounds of Hogwarts. Right. So other than his drinking <laughs> habit. Yeah. And that probably cost him quite a bit knowing how much Hagrid drinks but it doesn't seem like I mean he lives fairly frugally mm -hmm. he doesn't have like he probably you know, trades a lot especially with like the creatures and stuff like that mm -hmm. so because I know Slughorn at one point asked some like about the unicorn hair oh yeah and how much that's big... worth As, oh yeah I use that for binding you know whatever so um, but the eagle owl isn't on here and that is Draco's owl. Mm -hmm. And so if anything, people should be really more in awe with Draco's owl because that's even more rare than the snowy owl. Mm -hmm. But there's other places, there's Ilops, but there is also a magical creature shop. Right. Oh um, yeah. Is. Yeah. Um, I, I don't, I love and again, I will always go back to the writing because I'm, I'm very particular about, I love to read and I read a lot. Mm -hmm. And some books I feel like really capture well. And I, 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 the scene of Diagon Alley and just Harry wants to have, you know, more eyes to be able to take it all in. Yeah. And you have, I, I think for me, when I read it, there's a sense of wonder and awe and it's exciting and Rowling does a very good job of conveying that to her her audience because I'm just as excited like <gasps> yeah like I've heard that because I have you know haven't been to Universal yet but I heard like you can google it all you want and see all those pictures but when you're actually there and like just stepping out and seeing Gringotts and everything is it's just as magical I need to go that's one of the things on my that was 
on my wish list. <laughs> yeah, Still mine too. Is. And then then uh, COVID came and right, then, I was supposed then, to. Then the babies came and yeah, these whole babies thing that that derails. <laughs> Mm-hmm. That's what we were talking about. Like we had tentatively had a trip planned to the West coast. I had a friend in California. My husband has a friend in Seattle. Um, that friend now is in uh, Las Vegas, but we were going to go visit these friends as adults, like instead mm-hmm. of making a family vacation. Yeah. But you know, I wouldn't trade it for the world. That was the other comment that came with that conversation. So I love the, the, the little tidbits you get dragon liver, 17 sickles an ounce. I guess that's a pricey ingredient. And then right. Nimbus 2000. So I don't think like I'm reading this and I don't think I could do potions like ever because I mean, a dragon probably had to die to get that liver or was it already dead or are they getting harvested so that they can, you know, get these things. The same thing with, I think there was something else's eyes, beetles eyes and bat spleens and eel eyes and all sorts of things. And like, where do these things come from? Those poor animals. I think of it just like I go to the store and I buy chicken liver or beef liver. Mm Mm-hmm. I know they but... use dragon hide to make boots and jackets. Yeah. I so we, they use dragon steak. There's does somebody have a dragon farm? Like I have a, you know, I would have a beef farm. I, I grew up and I will, I'll preface this. that I grew up on a farm and I under like, to me, I have no qualms with anybody else who wants to eat differently. You can, if, you, if you're vegan, if you're vegetarian, if you're, that's great. I'm glad that works for you. I grew up where we were conscientious and caretaking of our animals, but the animals ultimately served the purpose of providing food. I, I think there's also, cause I mean, like we are omnivores, you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. So we're, that's our nature is to eat meat as well. So, um, and I mean, I do, <laughs> I don't like, I don't like it. I don't like the fact that I like to eat food that was once a living thing, but I do it because it tastes good and I have to survive. But like, um, I don't know, because I mean, there are so many things with like ethics involved with the treatment of those animals. And Mm -hmm. also like, that's do, do they, you know, what do they do with the other parts? Do they get wasted? Like if you're using like the whole animal type of thing and it's, and I kind of feel the same about hunting. Like if you're hunting and you use the animal and all of the animal for, you know, it various yeah. purposes versus just for sport. And like that, that's so wasteful of that life. Yeah. I, I feel so. the same way. And that's like, as like we had dairy cattle and we milked our dairy cattle and when they were no longer like that was not something they were able to do. We did, we did butcher them, but one, if you don't take care of your animals, you have sick animals and Mm. that's not, uh, our cows were very well cared for. I loved our cows. I would go snuggle our cows, but I also knew that ultimately they were cheeseburgers and I like cheeseburgers. I could never do that. (laughs) It's interesting. Like it's a very, you have to have a level of separation and it, it is a mindset and it's interesting because like we, um, we've chickens and we've thus far, we've only ever had layer chickens, but with the scarcity, um, the, the food chain and supply chain issues and the cost, we are discussing getting, um, meat chickens and it'll be a little bit of a different thing for my kiddos. Like I think conceptually they understand that, but, um, my, my mom grew up on a farm and she does not like to eat chickens because she used to see how they were, uh, prepared. <laughs> so, and I, my grandpa, like we have a, uh, a family cookbook of just all of the family recipes. And my grandpa's recipe is how to catch and kill and cook a chicken. I might need to borrow that cookbook. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, I think I'll send you, it will be I'll send you some pictures. It will probably be a situation when we go to, cause we will butcher and freeze. Um, 
but it will be a situation. My children, my oldest might be old enough to help. My youngers are too young for that. I don't think that's something that I really want my five-year-old helping with. Like, (laughs) then again, he might be okay with it. You never know. (laughs) But that is something like, I, I feel like that's something my stepdad did a really great job of is like, these are our animals. We take good care of them. We, you know, we're their caretakers and we want to have these robust and healthy and well cared for animals, but they serve, they ultimately serve that purpose of food. So squirrel, <laughs> we like yeah. went way off over there. Right. Yeah. <laughs> but it is like, it's interesting to think like, but you do, they do mention using different parts of the dragon, the scales, the, um, the dragon heart strings. The, mm-hmm. So I guess uh, dragon stakes, Hagrid has one later in a book, uh, the, the basically leather from the dragon. Right. Um, so they, obvi- I'm, I'm assuming they're being conscientious. I, I just sure hope so. And like, cause everybody in the wizarding world doesn't seem to be bothered by it. Mm-hmm. So Do I would think have, that there's gotta be some wizards? sort of level of, huh? Do they have vegan wizards? I don't know. That's interesting. Huh. I mean, if they do, they're not in the, the book. <laughs> they're not noted in the book. Um, so they're going into Gringotts and <laughs> like really random I, shift back into this. Yeah. And the goblins are bowing them in, which is again knowing that what we that know about deference is war. weird. Yeah. Three, I, three goblins bow, one on the outside door, and then they go through like the inner doors, and then two goblins bow to them there too. Mm-hmm. So they, like opening the door, I'm like envisioning them opening the door and yeah. So that's just weird. That seems so out of their character, unbefitting of a goblin. <laughs> but they also are taking in gold. And I like that they, pay, the they pay them well enough. <laughs> they pay them well enough to, to, to bow to wizards. Um, um, I love that the doors, like the first set is bronze. The second set is silver. And then on the inside you have the gold. So it's like progressive. Yeah. Like you, there, the gold is on the inside. Um, I love the poem. <laughs> I, I love it. I think it's, and the actual poem gets quoted later by Harry. Mm-hmm. but it, I think it's interesting. And I think it's all happening so fast. Like they're walking in, but Harry takes the time to stop and read this. So you have to like envision a pause because yeah. he, you know, it's not a long poem, but he's got to take the minute to, to read it. Yeah. And then remember it all those years later. Uh-huh. When they get to Harry's vault, green smoke comes out what hasn't been opened in so 10 years that just like the air that's released from it they're Um, underground yeah maybe and i think it adds a mystique to it yeah but the other one doesn't so how long has the how long has that package been in there is it because dumbledore just put that in the sorcerer's stone did flamel put it in did how i mean you from to Realistically, Flamel has to use the stone to make the elixir. Right. So it can't be something that's there for very long. You're just going to need it to make more elixir. Okay. Um, I will note that they ask for Harry's key. This is the only time Gringotts asks for the key. Um, because later, Mrs. Weasley gets money for Harry. Bill gets money for Harry. Right. Harry visits hmm. his own vaults regularly. Um, yeah, that's weird. Maybe because it was locked away for so long, he needed a key to validate it. I don't know. Just note to self, they ask for a key. Mm-hmm. Um, I do, we will note vault 713. And I love the, if anybody but a Gringotts goblin touches this, they get sucked inside. 
And mm-hmm. we check it every 10 years, no worries. <laughs> right. Um, again, we get a character that doesn't show up for years and years, but we do meet him again in Grip Hook. Yes. And I think we only ever get three goblins that we get names to. Grip Hook, Gornok, and Bogrod. Wow, you've got a memory. <laughs> I didn't, re- like, I couldn't remember the other two. Um, I, it took me a minute to remember Bogrod. I couldn't really remember. I just listened to, I, I listened, I was only yeah. five, so it's been a while. I don't know. I know Grip Hook and Gornok. And then Bogrod, like, it took me a minute to come up with that one. Um, Hagrid, again, more than me job's worth to tell you. Right. But he does tell them eventually. <laughs> right. I know. You just got to corner him in like the right way and he'll tell you whatever Ask, you want to know. Yeah. Like you got to catch him off of him. You know. Um, I like how Harry says that they, um, the Dursleys couldn't have known this existed. They'd have had it for him. They'd have had it yeah. from him because it costs so much to keep poor Harry who they don't feed very well and they only put him in Dudley's hand-me-downs and Mm. all his possessions only take one trip to get up the stairs. Well, I'm I'm sure that Dumbledore made it that way so that they wouldn't know about all that stuff, of course. Um, And I like how he says he doesn't need to know um, how many how many galleons to a pound to know that he has had more money than he ever had in his life more right. money than even Dudley had had because they probably took out a considerable sum knowing that he needs a wand and he needs a cauldron and he needs robes and like there's a lot of like some yeah, of the stuff we don't have an investment and and we don't even know how much any of that stuff costs Mm-mm. they so. do mention the wand and I it's here somewhere when we get to Ollivanders I'm sure I'll, yeah um, I, but, I think it's interesting that um, Hager gets motion sickness. Mm-hmm. The, so what's the difference between stalactites and stalagmites? <laughs> stalagmites got an M in it. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Pretty Very much. Like, like, why, why do they even need to have different names? They're practically the same thing, except for one goes up and one goes down, right? It's a difference in how they're formed, I think. I don't know. I, I used to know that. Because we, Tomato my grandparents tomorrow. were real big on, we went to the caverns and got to see them at certain points. They're beautiful. I think that sort of stuff is very pretty. Yeah. Oh, maybe we'll I, do that. Sorry, I just had a, we're, we're planning a trip for the summer and I'm like, oh, I know the caverns are in Kentucky. We could go on our way to see Rachel. There you go. Um, I think stalactites are on the top. And mm-hmm. I think that's like how I remember it, is the T for the top. Um, so the first, so we've got, so, Harry filled up his money bag. Yep. Hagrid then Hagrid goes him. for a pick me up down at the leaky cauldron, although he comes back with ice cream. So that's, he that's must drink pretty fast. <laughs> um, well, how long does it take? Like Harry's got to get fitted. So I'm thinking, and he said, has this whole long conversation. So Hagrid probably goes, has a drink, brings back his ice cream. Yeah. Um, Madame Malkins. And again, colors. She's dressed all in mauve. Mm-hmm. There's kind and, of like some talk about like, what if Harry and Harry had become friends with Draco instead of Ron? And I, interestingly enough, don't think that would happen. No. Because the first thing he says about Draco reminds me of Dudley. Right. Um, and Draco mentions that his mother's looking at wands and is, I, I don't remember where he says his dad is, but his mom is looking at wands. Yeah. School books. So is she, but she's not, how does that work? Because the wand chooses the wizard. If he's getting fitted, she's not going to be able to just buy him a random him wand, a wand or, do, or does she? And can't, you know, and he doesn't even, he's not even part of that process. So he's missing out on the magical experience. 
I think it just goes to show like he's so spoiled. Like his parents would do yeah. anything for him. Mm-hmm. Um, we're getting little more more tidbits about the wizarding world. And it's interesting, like thinking about reading this for the first time and not knowing what these things are either. Mm-hmm. It gives you lots of questions. Like you have those same questions firing in your head as, as Harry. Like what is right? Yeah. yeah. Hufflepuff? what now like rereading it you know like oh yeah i know what that is i know what that is i know what that is but um you know he's like quidditch slytherin and he's not very nice to hagrid oh i hear he's kind of a servant and then he drinks too much and sets fire to his bed (laughs) which does sound exactly like hagrid though to be honest (laughs) And I mean, when you're, when you're raised in that mindset of people looking down on people like that, then Mm -hmm. you use that kind of tone of he gets drunk and sets fire to his, tries to do magic and (laughs) probably does that fire to his bed because he can't be too good at it. Yeah. With the broken wand. And he's better than I think we could ever imagine him being with Mm -hmm. it, with the broken wand. And I think it just depends on what he's trying to do. Yeah. Yeah. I like how Harry's like, he just does not like Draco. It's right. an immediate dislike. Harry's like, nah. Not well, him. I think, because like one of the words that Draco uses right off the bat is that he's going to bully his dad. Like he actually uses the word bully. Mm-hmm. And and Harry has been bullied his whole life. So it's like, why would he want to be around this person? And going back to Draco knows that Hagrid does magic. Yeah. So it's well known that Hagrid does magic, mm-hmm. <laughs> that he's not supposed to do magic because he's been expelled. Like, I just don't like that how, whole thing. How, like, does I'm nobody, like, how does nobody enforce these things? Like, none of it gets enforced. But you don't have, like, this is what I don't get. I can choose to homeschool my wizard child, they mm-hmm. would never go to Hogwarts. So if they get expelled, can I still homeschool them, wizard? I don't and know. Hagrid's expulsion, because they never actually prove that, Ar- like, we know is Aragog, but mm-hmm. if they had proven that Hagrid killed Myrtle. He'd be an Askman. He's, he'd be an Askman, which is hilarious that Ron makes that joke. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. about riddle <laughs> yes i don't know that just popped into my head um but but they can't prove that it was him so they don't have him in azkaban so if he's innocent but the, then how did he get expelled like it just the whole like yeah. but again i feel like there's not a whole lot of consistency in the judicial system there's not it's a horrible system it needs to be redone hermione get on it exactly so I like how Hagrid kind of reassures Harry that, mm-hmm. you no, know, it's fine. You will catch up soon enough. It's not a big deal. Like right. everybody starts at the beginning. Um, Harry's actually done with his fitting before Malfoy is. And Malfoy got there first. Yeah. It's, it know, almost seems like he's been an there assistant long. helping her. So maybe the assistant's just not as, uh, as fluid as Madame Malkin. I don't know. But like, it it also, it's also amazing that, I mean, I know Harry's like super interested in everything that's going on, Mm -hmm. but he's remembering all of these words like Quidditch. These are all new words to him. Um, (laughs) Rufflepuff. Oh my gosh. Ravenclaw and Hufflepuff are, these are all new words. And yet Mm -hmm. when he goes back to Hagrid, he's like, tell me what is Quidditch? What is Ravenclaw? What is Hufflepuff? And like years later, when he's supposed to be learning Occlumency, he's like, Occlu, what? (laughs) Like, (laughs) yeah. So he's also younger though. Yeah, I suppose. Um, I have just a couple notes about the different shops he visited, visits, um, that you know flourish and blots his he always goes back to like his frame of reference of the dursleys and he's like oh my gosh dudley who doesn't read would have loved to have seen this store yeah uh, the apothecary smells bad but 
very it smells like cabbage <sighs> and mrs figs place always smelled of cabbage so was she trying to do make potions, potions? um Ilops his birthday gift from Hagrid and Hagrid even says um pro, like the Dursleys never got but you didn't get very many presents from them Dursleys mm -hmm. Hagrid has a big heart and he really does love Harry and then the thing Harry is most excited about a wand Ollivanders and when Ollivanders has been making wands for quite some time yes he's Hagrid says it's the only place for wands although we do know that there are other wand makers and even in book six Mr. Weasley says that they'll get by with other wand other makers. wand makers so there's got to be some other wand makers maybe not in Diagon Alley but other places mm -hmm. um Ollivanders, makers of fine wands since 382 BC. Yes, I know it's so old. They've been making wands for a long time. I enjoy the character of Ollivander. I do too. There's so much mystery around him. And when Harry's in the shop, like he feels the magic. And I love that he feels the magic. And I actually thought that that kind of feeling, because he feels it sporadically here and there too, mm -hmm. like when he's in the wizarding world, he'll feel that magic. I thought that that was going to come in a big play in book six, like when Dumbledore is teaching him about certain magics. And I thought he would use that more in book seven. And it's very disappointing that he doesn't. Hmm. Like all of these things, like, because that's probably how Voldemort found where the ring was because there's and in the cave there's that magic around it but it's like no it's going to be here and there because they already have the magic and you don't need to worry about it like it's you know, like um we're, i can't even remember where they all were right now but he just seems to have an easier time with them like the diary was just the throwaway mm -hmm. so that didn't even have any protection around it at all no, he gave it to Lucius Malfoy. Yeah. But he's got a bunch. And that's what, that's mm -hmm. why that intrigued Dumbledore to begin with. with right. The diary, because if he was so willing to just hand this one off and put it in danger. Yeah. There must be he, more. Yeah. Um, Ollivander has an amazing memory. I know he can remember every wand he's ever sold, and he's got yeah. to have sold thousands, right? Thousands and thousands of wands. How I, old is Ollivander? Because huh? we know when the shop was. We know when the shop was established, but obviously he's not that old. It's probably like a family name. Ollivander sold Hagrid his wand, so we obviously he's over fifty. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, and he's very old. I think yeah. they discuss this later. Like he's old and frail. Um, Ollivander, the character of Ollivander has to be a Ravenclaw. That's what I would think. He has yeah. to be. He is so interested in knowledge for the sake of knowledge. And it's interesting, like he doesn't have that, the ethics of it don't always fall into play. I think is a, is a good way to say it. Um, yeah. That because he who must not be, did, uh, be named did great things terrible, terrible but great but great and it's more important that like you can see he's really interested around in that magic that surrounds it yes i mean i think we as the readers kind of are as well because mm -hmm. i would love to have a voldemort backstory like that's why book six is my favorite like getting into the psyche and the why voldemort is mm -hmm. the way he is and getting like seeing young Tom, like Tom Riddle becoming mm -hmm. and evolving into it. And I would actually like to have known more than that, but that's part of the mystery of it is that we don't know more than that, which is makes it even more intriguing. And, and, and I Ollivander think, backstory would be interesting. Yeah. 
And I think we're going to get some of this with the Fantastic Beast series. I think we're going to see more of Ollivander. I think we're going to see more of, I think we're going to see some of Tom Riddle. Because 50 years ago, these came out in the 90s, or are set in the 90s. So we're thinking 50 years ago, it would have been 1940s. And then Dumbledore defeats Grindelwald in 1945. Right now they're set in the 1920s. But in the 1940s, which had been 50 years ago, um, then Tom Riddle was at Hogwarts. We're going to need a timeline. I know. <laughs> well, I mean, even with that, time, like we're starting to see some intersections there. Like Lestrange mm-hmm. is a name that comes up. That there's intersections. And I, I'm, I'm liking that. that. That intrigues me. But I just, I love Ollivander and his unabashed pursuit of knowledge. Yeah. He's, and I, like, I know I weigh he, into the ethics side of things, but I like to learn about things just for the sake of learning about them. Mm-hmm. I'm not, I'm like, no, I don't want to know that. I do want to know that. I, yes. Let me know. What, what is that? Can I read about it? Okay. So I, I really enjoy Ollivander as a character. And Harry's like, I don't know if I like him. And I can see it. Well, for one, he, when he meets Harry, he goes right up into his face. Like they're almost nose to nose. It's like boundaries, dude. I know you like, and he like moves his hair and looks at his, th- like, that's pretty rude. Come on now. No touchy. Um, and, and yet like, and I don't understand. And maybe it's just like a diversionary tactic when people walk in, but like, he's getting measured like the measuring tape is doing all these measurements between his nose <laughs> and, and, and then, but Ollivander's already off looking for things. He comes back. He didn't do anything with the measuring tape. Like he's already got his boxes and has decided what's going on. Mm-hmm. And he actually starts Harry off with shorter ones. Like his mom was 10 and a quarter inches. His dad was 11 inches. And then he comes giving him seven eight and, a half, and eight and a half. Seven. And, but he ends up with an 11, which is, you know, like I said, his mom was 10 and his dad 10 and something and his dad was 11 something. And I don't know how it works with, um, you know, like how, if it goes like that in families. I don't know. Hagrid has a 13 inch wand and Umbridge is rather short. Like they make that comment that her wand is short and she's also very short. So I think it has to do with your height at some point, but it would have to Voldemort's be your adult is, height. Voldemort is 13 and a half inches though. So I think he might be overcompensating because he wants people to see he's a wizard. And so he wants that wand to be noticeable. Yes. 13 and a half inches. You. And powerful wand. Very powerful. And so I think that Harry also has that little bit of. Like, oh no. Hagrid's wants- was 16 inches. Sorry. Okay. 13 inches. 13 and a half was Tom Riddle. Hagrid's 16 inches. Oak. Rather bendy. Wasn't it? <laughs> So, but yeah, I think, I don't know if it has to do probably a little bit of size and comfort, like for Hagrid's case, but I think also like in a, in a typical wizard's hand might have to do something with their, I don't know, it might be based on height. I don't know. Cause he is doing measurements, whether or not he looks at them or not <laughs> the numbers, but I can just see, especially in Voldemort's, his, uh, his attitude in wanting a longer wand so that it sticks out mm-hmm. and I think that Harry's could also be a little bit longer just because he might have that kind of pride in being a wizard because it means that he's less like the Dursleys or something I don't know I have no idea why I wrote Grindelwald down next to this I'm like glancing back at the page I have no idea I just have Grindelwald written next to the thing maybe I was <laughs> thinking about um Grigorovich. Grigorovich and <laughs> you know, I don't know. Um, I love how excited or Ollivander is this haha, <laughs> tricky customer. Right. And the other thing that I think is interesting that the sparks that shoot from Harry's wand are red and gold. Mm. I think that's like foreshadowing. Gryffindor colors. Gryffindor. Pretty much. Like, would mine be blue? That's an excellent point. Or like red and gold, just kind of like standard, like. 
How much does a wand cost? Did you find it? Um, yes, I did. It was seven gold galleons for his wand. That money. is expensive. Now, do you think that the ga- that the wands are based off of their length and their core and the wood that they're made out of, or are, like all wands seven galleons? I don't know. Uh, we'll have to check that when we get to book three because, or yeah, book three because. Ron gets a new wand and I think he does say how much it costs. Okay. So we'll get there. Um, and then they're pretty much done. They take the train back to London and then, uh, or he gets them on the train to go back to London. Did the Dursleys pick Harry up then? And how I does he just ride the train with- back to a, a nearby train station and walks home, catches a cab. He, well, he, he wouldn't have any muggle money. So he'd have to pay in wizard money or, or he would have, to, it would have to be close enough to walk home. But he does say at some point that he's never been to London, which is weird because I did look at a map and they are like the next, but I don't, they don't know, really take him. area. They're, 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 they're the next area below London. So like Surrey is right below London. So I don't know if it's like county as we would call it or a borough. I don't know how that works, but I don't know, but they can't, they're not far off. So, I mean, it's not, I would assume that he would be able to walk it, but I think it would take him a while. To With all his that. stuff too. Yeah. Um, but how would he communicate to the Dursleys to pick him up? Last he knew he left them on the, <laughs> on that rock on the hut, the hut on the rock. So, How did he get off the rock on the hut or the hut yeah. on the rock? And he wants to watch Hagrid like until he's out of sight, but he blinks and he's and gone. He disappears. Did he apparate? Does Hagrid know how to apparate? I'm really confused. I wouldn't think he would be able to because of the giant blood in him, though. Yeah. Like I don't, he's too I imagine him too big to apparate. And if he and if he could, then he would have just apparated to the hut on the rock instead of flying and he can't use magic (laughs) like i'll say that again because you need to be able to use magic to apparate and that is very dangerous to do even for a qualified wizard you need a license to apparate yes even though harry never apparates with a license they do not tell you how much ron's one cost oh okay Sorry. Oh. I, I, I knew I had book three in my cabinet right here. So I like reached down to grab it because I had reference. I'd asked, I was curious if Fudge brought up Godric's Hollow mm-hmm. in book three. So I had this here ah, because I looked it up a while ago. So yeah, page 56, book three. Um, they tell you it's 14 inches willow containing one unicorn tail hair. I have a note here. I have no idea what it's supposed to be, but, and I can't read this word, but I, Harry something, the magician, Ollivander's book seven question mark. What the heck does that mean? Like, <laughs> At least I'm not the only one. Like, why do I have the name Grindelwald written in my notes? Um, I think that has to do with Harry has a similar, like they talk about that twin core connection again in book seven what and we'll talk about this later this will be a book two conversation but why can't they fix wands why can they not be repaired right oh i think it senses harry senses the magic in not magician the magic in ollivanders and we did talk about that and that and yeah that's why it comes back to book seven so harry keeps saying throughout this chapter vol i mean you know who Vol- yeah, he's I mean, like you know, trying like, to get around it. Like he never says Voldemort. Mm-hmm. I don't think he ever says Voldemort in this chapter. Like Hagrid says it once and he wants to keep using it. And I get why he would memorize that name and want to memorize that name. That's the guy who killed his parents. So I think there's a part of him that wants to keep saying it because of that. And, and then it comes up in the next chapter again, but we'll get there when we get there. But just in this chapter, he does not say Voldemort. He just says, Vol, I mean, you know who, mm-hmm. every time. 
And we already talked. I, I have a bunch of notes scattered in at the end here too. Have you also- nonverbal spells? Do you need a wand to get into Diagon Alley? If, assuming that you went through the pub. I, well, you have to tap it three times. I, I actually have that as a side note. Like, how but do you could, you, like, could you tap it with like a pen? Like, does it have to be a wand? Do you have to be magical? Because when muggles, muggleborns go in there for the but first time. Maybe Tom would help them. Okay. Three up, two across, tap, tap, tap. Yeah, he would have to let them in then if, if you have to be magical to do it. I like that Hagrid's advice to Harry is to just be himself. Mm -hmm. That's good advice. Hagrid actually has some pretty good advice throughout the book. And he gets so little credit. But he gives some of the best advice. Like I like the, um, I'll read this little snippet because I haven't really done any of my thing. I always go back to the text. Yes. I love it. Um, it says, don't worry, Harry, you'll learn fast enough. Everyone starts at the beginning at Hogwarts. You'll be just fine. Just be yourself. I know it's hard. You've been singled out and that's always hard, but you'll have a great time at Hogwarts. I did. Still do, as a matter of fact. Like, Hagrid's like, it's fine. You'll be yourself and have fun. And what better advice, like, as a, like, thinking as a parent, like, what better advice can you give your kid? Just be yourself yeah. and enjoy it. That's so hard when you're a teenager, though, because nobody wants to be themselves. They, you know, that's just, I mean, in our advancing age, yeah, it's easier, but it's still hard. There are times when I'm like, when you say something that is a very uniquely you and everybody around the table kind of looks at you like, did she just say that? And you're like, This is why I miss you at work, by the way. (laughs) Because at least I knew if I said something that was a little on the the fringe, I had someone across the table going, yeah. Yeah, see, I grew up only child. So it's like, when you say something weird, like it's weird. And you might have to say a psychiatrist for it at one point. (laughs) I mean, hey, whatever. I grew up actually an eccentric household, so. Yeah. Psychiatry helped me out years later down the road anyway. So it's good. It's just good pe- for people on the whole. Anyway, so, so be ourselves and have fun. And that's how we're going to get to Hogwarts. Yes. Um, I have a, a couple notes I skipped over. Um, the, just the, the class list that Harry gets, it seems to do a pretty good job as far as, and maybe it's because it's a private school you know, and they all wear the uniforms and stuff like that, but it does a very good job of being specific enough that all of the students come in feeling equal. Like they're Mm -hmm. only allowed to have black robes. I think in the later books, um, uh, Draco is being fitted with green ones. So it's one of those things where they, they all go in as equal. You can only have a pewter thing because Harry wants to get the gold cauldron. cauldron, No, it says pewter Um, on your list. Yeah. And I think that's kind of nice that Hagrid's there to scale him back because Mm -hmm. Harry has never had anything and he wants to get everything. And he's like, no, you can't get gold. You can only get pewter. That's what's here. So it it reins him in a little bit. I'm a strong proponent of uniforms. I really, and even, and it's interesting, like I was one of those kids that if they had told me I had to wear uniforms in in high school, I would have been okay with it. Like I probably would have been too. I'm, we are not impoverished, but we're thrifty. I think that's a good way to describe my family. We're thrifty. And growing up, I mean, I was the oldest of five children. My mom was going to school. Um, her and dad both worked, but we did not have unlimited resources. Yeah. And, but, and I, I think, think uniforms, even the playing field a little bit. I mean, and there's, there's still ways to tell, um, what your kind of class level is, I mm-hmm. suppose, because like Ron, he's, he's still going there, you know, and he's going to be wearing the same black robes, but his, their second hand black robes. And we all know when you wash black a couple of times, it's less it's black. Yeah. 
Um, and also they're too short for him because Ron is very tall. And I don't know whose robes he got, maybe Charlie's, because I think Charlie is shorter. Yeah, Ron and Percy are tall and thin. And Bill. Charlie, I don't, I really have an issue with the hand-me-downs and I get why. You got a wand, fix it. <laughs> right, Reparo. Exactly. Reparo that, that robe. Anyway, that, that always, I was thinking about that. There was another circumstance that I kind of was like, transfigure it. You can change the color. You can turn a raccoon into something. You can turn a... <laughs> Uh, you can vanish a snail like you can fix the you can touch up the color on your uh yeah on ropes but and again I, mrs weasley has a lot of kids right and there is not a lot of time when you have a lot of kids but you have me. a lot of but you have magic if you could magically wash your dishes how much time would you save if you could magic, magic your laundry to fold itself how much time would you save <laughs> like i would be cleaning everything all the time and it would be like clean, clean, because everything would be just swish and flick. Uh, then I'd be levitating everything, but you know what I mean? Like, no, I get it. Right I, I really wish and things would be, would be clean. I want to house done. elf. I really... <laughs> Did... What, what does even, a, I mean, a house elf has their own magic. Can't they just kind of be like, it's done. They do. I think, um, I feel like they I, do it more I, manual labor though. Like if they're going to dust, they actually have to use the rag instead of, or do they just like make it look like they are? And then they just kind of like sit back. <laughs> they wouldn't because that's just not how they're portrayed in the books. Well, they have limits on their magic because of the enslavement. Right. Because it, like ha- house elves have a lot of magic, but they're not allowed to use it. I, I don't want a house elf. I take that back. I would love not to have to clean my house, but I do not want a house elf. Um, I think like if, if I came from a family that had already had a house elf and I inherited a house elf and knowing if my house elf didn't want to be free, like we would just be buds. Like, yeah. you know, like I would just hang out with my house elf. Like, I don't think I would make it do the work or if it did, like I would do the work with it or help mm-hmm. it like with my wand cleaning and stuff. And then be like, let's go hang out. I want Dolby. Yeah. I actually have a sign that says, um, please clean up after yourself. Our house elf has been freed. <laughs> it hangs in my, uh, right outside my bathroom. <laughs> I remind my children of that often. <laughs> like, we don't have house elf, clean up, pick that up. Like, so aside from the uniforms, you can also tell kind of somebody's thing because they may bring with them an animal mm-hmm. and depending on if they bring something and what they bring, that kind of shows a status. Um, so they can really? bring an owl or a cat or a toad. And in the first years, they're not allowed to have rooms unless you are Harry Potter. Um, <laughs> there was a first year on the house team a hundred years ago. So maybe they, there was somebody else that got permission. Yeah. I, there's a, there's a theory that it's Dumbledore. Yeah. I was wondering about that. I'm like, probably Dumbledore. How old Um, is Dumbledore? There, there is an age. I know, I don't remember, but I remember there's, they talk about the age Dumbledore was when he passed as well as the age that, because he lives so much longer than Tom Riddle. Right. I think Tom Riddle was like 70 or -hmm. something when he died. And he wanted to live forever, but if he would have just like lived a quiet life and not tried to go around killing everybody and living forever, he would have just lived a longer life. Mm-hmm. But um, but owls, cats, and toads are allowed. And so and Ron of brings a rat. The ro- <laughs> yeah, like Harry Potter is the broom exception, and Ron is the rat exception. I but guess Lee Jordan brings a tarantula later. Like but yeah, I don't know that that was like his pet i think he was like lee jordan's kind of strikes me as he's just going to try to do something under the radar Mm -hmm. but like this is ron's pet like that's his animal and i mean why even have a rule if you're not going to enforce the rules so that is an interesting i i did think that was interesting that they didn't list rats on the list right and and like cats are similar to kneesles which Mm -hmm. i think 
Crookshanks is half Kneasel anyway. I think so. so how too. do they do that with those kind of breeds? Like, does it matter that I and I think Kneasel and how is does something like in in book five they uh, friend George leave Lee a couple of nifflers? Like, where'd they get those nifflers? Yeah, I know stealing them from Hagrid or Newt. <laughs> I, I, I uh, rescued this from the care of magical creatures class. <laughs> I think we discussed that, that little tidbit. No, um, it is interesting. I think there's a lot of very poorly enforced rules at Hogwarts. No magic in the corridors. Yeah. Yeah. No Frank. I think they rely a lot on prefects to enforce the rule. Right. Um, um, so there's a few things later, like when um, Harry and Hagrid are talking and there, is, there are a couple different theories on what house Hagrid is in. I think mm-hmm. it's like officially on Pottermore somewhere that it says Gryffindor now, but I think at one point it wasn't ever labeled. And so people have um, talked that maybe he was in Slytherin and there's a th- theory there are theories out there about that about why and because of his connection with tom riddle in the third book so we might get into that one later but in this but there's also the theory that he is a hufflepuff i think he's a hufflepuff that if i had to like just because his and when we get to the sorting hat chapter we'll talk more on like how i feel about sorting and something that is interesting and why i think it runs in families and things like that and i look at like Obviously, it's imperfect. We're being sorted based on questions that were asked with, you know, the Potter one. But there is a huge correlation with family. Um, but if you boil down, like, what is one of the key things for Hagrid? And it's loyalty. He's incredibly loyal. Right. And typically, and like, that kind of... That, that kind of kindness for animals and others is very Hufflepuffy too. Mm-hmm. Um, and when he says, um, Harry asks them, what are Slytherin and Hufflepuff? Schoolhouses, there's four. Everyone says Hufflepuff are a lot of duffers, but, and then Harry cuts him off. Like, no, 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 and I then it's, to... like, it's almost like, but I was in Hufflepuff. Like, you know what I mean? Like, uh-huh. or, or one of my best friends was in Hufflepuff or, you know, with Newt Scamander as far as like their, because they have to be in in communication at some mm-hmm. point because of their care of magical creatures. Yeah. So I just want to know what Hagrid was going to say on that. But and Harry interrupts people a lot, and it drives me nuts because I want to know what that person has to say. Like, and sometimes he just he. I'm going to be tracking all, all of the times that Harry interrupts people on a separate thing, and that might just be its own separate video because it happens. A oh. bit. Yeah. Um, then he, so then Hagger goes on to tell him that not a single witch or wizard who went bad that wasn't in Slytherin, but what? Peter Pettigrew did. Although we think that it's serious either way, they're both in Gryffindor. So that's not a true statement, Hagger. <laughs> I think he's overgeneralizing. I, everybody overgeneralizes Slytherin though. I know. It's kind of sad. I feel bad for them. And maybe that's because I'm a Hufflepuff. And like, and I see like all of, I'm, I feel, I feel like overgeneralizing as a thing Mm -hmm. usually gets you, you, there are always exceptions to the rule. There is always exceptions to the rule. And there is always, There's always another way to look at it. Mm. Open your mind. I think overgeneralizations tend to be closed-minded. And I, I, I use them too. I'm human. Yeah. So like Hagrid is, it's, he, he does that overgeneralization thing. And he talks a lot because we know that he lets out a lot of secrets. But we also know that when he needs to keep it short, especially with his um, his past at Hogwarts sometimes, like regarding the Chamber of Secrets, he's very quiet. So um, at one point he's talking about, you know, who going to Hogwarts. It is like years and years ago, like not 50 years ago when yeah, I was in when school I was there. with him in classes together. 
Like Hagrid knows who Tom Hagrid Riddle was in his was. third year. Riddle was in fifth year, fifth year. I think so. But still, they they would have been in the same. I mean, two years difference. But like Harry knows Lee Jordan, and yeah, they you crossed know what I mean. paths. Yeah, clearly. Um, they knew each other well enough that like, because he calls him Rubius. Like they're on a first name basis. Yeah, that's part. That's part of that underlying theory about them knowing each other well enough type of thing. Although I think everybody knows who Fred and George Weasley are because they cause trouble and Hagrid gets in trouble a lot. Yeah. Everybody knows the bad kid because teachers have to say their name a lot. Yeah, that's true. So one of the things in the classroom, my first year, it wasn't even my class, but we had shared classrooms at the time. Like it was every, I had class on Monday, Tuesday, Monday, Wednesday, Thursday, and they had Monday, Wednesday, Friday, and they had class on Tuesday, Thursdays. So I was in the classroom and I saw these kids and they would always blame that kid that kid because they knew the teacher would yell at that kid all the time. So even when that kid wasn't anywhere around, he was, he was absent one day. So the kids would be like, happened. Oh, he did it. He's not even here to do it. But the kids picked up on the teachers always yelling and saying it was his fault that things happened. Mm-hmm. And so the kids just blamed him so that they didn't have to get in trouble for it. Yep. So even when, and it, and it was sad because like there are a couple of times that that kid and another kid would be arguing, this kid starts something and he would blame that kid. And the teachers automatically knew this was the kid to blame. They and took this kid. And they say that, wasn't. like, it was my word against, Riddle says that it was my word against Hagrid's who was in trouble every other week. Yes. So my last comment on here, I don't know if you know who Mitch Hepburn is. He is a comedian. I think he's dead now. But one of his lines, because they said they had to go up the broken escalators. And one of Mitch Hepburn's jokes is, escalators cannot break. They can only become stairs. <laughs> so I, ju- I wrote that down in my thing. And that's like, Mitch is just famous for like those one line, like one or two line like, short jokes. Very genius. Very so. witty. Oh, I lied. I do have one more note. Um, and it was, it kind of goes back to the Mrs. Fig trying to make things. Mm -hmm. Um, and we might've talked about this before, but I don't remember if we did it in recording or if it was like off the record on the phone or something, but squibs and like the non-magical people should be able to go to Hogwarts and do certain classes. Yeah. You can still take history and magic. Yeah. They could still take care of magical creatures herbology potions potions. well i think some potions you need a wand for it but partial potions i think you're Um, right i wonder if that's something that they will figure out later i doubt it (laughs) very exclusive yeah i mean they're not going to do anything with it in the um like try to be progressive with it in like the fantastic beast series because that's set in the past and this is set in the unless Ilvermorny does something like that. No, I think the Americans were even more like you're not allowed to marry a muggle. Yeah, I was gonna say I, I America's pretty backwards to begin with, even in like the modern standards of magic and the real world. But maybe Bobatons is progressive. Maybe. Yeah, because I, I don't see Durmstrag being very progressive. <laughs> not under Karkarop anyway. Right. Well, maybe that he's gone. Maybe they turned over. Who knows? New leaf. Yeah. So before next week will be. Ah, I just had it and I closed the book. The journey journey platform nine and three quarters. Yes. Um, I do have a few notes on the audio. Oh, yes. Because there is some there's some vocab difference. Um, so, and it's weird, mint, peppermint, notes and bills for the money. Mm -hmm. Um, the set books versus the course books, um, restaurant and bar for like when they go to get the hamburger. Mm -hmm. So it's like a hamburger restaurant or a hamburger bar, the barman versus the bartender. Um, Tom is described as gummy instead of toothless. Hmm. So I thought that was an interesting. I like one. that. I like that. Term. Gummy. We call the baby. When I think of gummy, I think of like the chewy candies, not being gummy, like a grandma type of thing. Interesting. Cause we call the baby a gummy bear. 
Oh, because she when she smiles, we're like, there's your gummy bear smile because she doesn't have any teeth. She's working on them, but she didn't have any yet. <laughs> there is um, there's there's a weird change in here when Hagrid says you saw him in the leaky cauldron versus you saw what everyone in the leaky cauldron like you. It's it's just yeah, you saw what everyone in the leaky cauldron was like versus you saw them in the leaky cauldron. It was too the weird. Change. I don't know. Weird change. Um, and another weird change is when they describe um, Hedwig. She's a sleeping snowy owl in the audiobook, but in the book she's a snowy owl asleep. And in the audiobook, it didn't say in its cage. So this is again a weird change. Like I'm like, how's it? Like, yeah, I don't I don't understand some of these changes. And and then there's changes again, like toward towards that or which leaned and lent. Um, it's and that's in and on. And they're just such little tiny grammatical changes mm-hmm. um instead of like you know noun changes. And the interesting thing is when I first was reading this without the audiobooks, mm-hmm. I was reading knuts as nuts because I thought that the K was silent like in night and no um and knee so I'm going around calling their magic money he's buying this with nuts but the audiobook at least the British audiobook pronounces the K and Jim Dale does too enough Jim Dale reads Voldemort as Voldemort really in book one at least See, I was actually, I'm, I thought about making the comment in, I think it was the last chapter when Hagrid writes down the name because um, he can't, or says the name because he can't write the name mm-hmm. because of the way, because it's French. So it's supposed to be Voldemort and the T is silent. Um, but in the British, like UK, they say Voldemort, like they uh-huh. pronounce that hard T, which is, was interesting to me because I would think because of the UK and they typically are more familiar with the very, you know, France is pretty close by. They use a lot of language interchangeably. Like they, they'll say more like, um, you know, oh, I don't want to say, say la vie, that's like Spanish or something, but, or no, that is French, but you know, like they, they use that more interchangeably in Europe to my knowledge, mm-hmm. like they'll use more phrases from other countries more than we do here yeah so they would have a bit more understanding of their language i don't know it's a lot more common in europe for you to be um bilingual as well yeah yeah so that's why it just kind of shocked me that that was like that but i don't know did you have any other notes i'm still trying to figure out why i wrote grindelwald (laughs) it'll come to you, I you had remember, to have had a thought and I like, was like, I'm, I'm in, I'm always, my note taking style is a, you know, trigger words. Right. So I'm well, still it like, was, really baffled. Like, why did I write that? Why? In regards to Ollivander, maybe something to do with the Deathly Hollow, like the Elder Wand. I really, and honestly, like <laughs> there's a whole lot of things that I can come up with that maybe, but none of them are like, yeah, that's why I wrote it. Okay. I'll if you think about it, we'll have to do like a short or something like this, oh, this is why I wrote that. <laughs> I, um, it will be the middle of the night. I'm like, oh. You can text it to me. I'll be up in the middle of the night at some point. <laughs> text me, I'll get it in the middle of the night. Yeah. <laughs> well, everybody, that is our perspective. Let us know yours in the comments below. Before we go, we'd like to thank our editor, Alan, our families, our listeners. Um, and remember to like, share, subscribe, and support. So until next time, stay safe, keep faith. Good night.